Open your Bibles to Psalm 115. Psalm 115. And we are quickly nearing the end of our time in Psalms for the summer. And I pray that does not equal you ending your time in the Psalms because uh, I don't know about you, but this has been extremely beneficial for me. Um, at times, uh, I would say uncomfortable for me because the Lord uses the Psalms to really hone in on where we are lacking most, and <laughs> that is not always comfortable, but it is often what we need. We may ask the question, especially in challenging seasons, why should I praise God? Uh, if you were to talk with or engage with someone who is uh, not in Christ, they would see really no reason to praise the Lord. Uh, in fact, it's often a point of ridicule for people of faith. Uh, why do you feel the need to go to someone you've never seen and have never audibly heard or some people would say have no good evidence of, which we could dispute, why would you praise him at all? Uh, those attacks are often even worse when we're going through something really challenging or really difficult, uh, whether that be attacks spiritually in our own lives or attacks of other people who would communicate and say, why praise the Lord? Maybe even they question, you say you worship this God, where's he now? Uh, the reality is, uh, if you were with us last week, you recognize that it's not all that uncommon for us to experience dark days where we go, is, is the Lord gone? Is his word changed? His promises changed? Have all, has all of this failed now? And then the psalmist in Psalm 77 goes back and appeals to the right hand of the Most High. He appeals back to who God has been and who he will continue to be because his word says he never changes. Turn to your neighbor and say, he never changes. So ultimately, in the midst of this, if you get nothing else out of today, I want you to get this. Because of who God is and all he has done, we will trust the Lord. Because of who God is and what he has already done, we will trust him. Now, ultimately, if you want to answer the question, why should we trust the Lord, this is the answer. It really is the simple answer. I will trust him because of who he is and what I've already witnessed that he's done. In the, in the scope of life as a whole, if God were to not do anything more, we would have enough reason to trust him simply in what he has already done. The most significant of that is what he has already done in Christ. That would be making a way for sinful people like you and me to be in the presence of God at all. If that is the only thing that God ever did, we would have more than enough reason to praise him. Now, in saying all that, I will be the first to tell you it's a lot easier to look at a statement like this and go, this is really easy for me to even memorize, but in practice is extremely challenging. And the reason for that is because we like to think that God will function as some genie in the bottle for us. And in fact, there is many teachers that will perpetuate that and say, if you are following the Lord the way you're supposed to be, then God will give you everything you ask for. And usually it's with a tagline of, just give a hundred more dollars here and all your dreams will come true. It's just not the case. And in fact, what we're gonna see even here today is that 
who God is is the same regardless of your social status. It doesn't matter. God doesn't care about your money. He doesn't care about your job, your stuff. And when I say he doesn't care, I don't mean that he doesn't have a perspective that we should look into and follow. The scripture talks a ton about money, talks a ton about how we live our life, talks a ton about how we should live in relationship with one another. But the primary concern here is, am I trusting, glorifying, and honoring the Lord? All of these aspects of life that become the focus of our lives tend to keep us from trusting, let alone praising the Lord. Because of who God is and all he's done, we will trust the Lord. Now, ultimately, when we come to Psalm 115, as we read 113 and 114, this is usually used in sequence with all of these from 113 to 113. 118, as a means of reminding the people of Israel why they should praise the Lord. And so they will come back to these every year during Passover season, and ultimately comes to this place of recognizing that the the goal here is that the Lord would be praised in light of all that we're facing, that the Lord would be praised. Verse 1, it says, not to us, O Lord... Not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Now, if you wanted to target one singular goal, the end goal of this psalm, it's that this would be true of God's people. That God's people would be able to confidently assert that it's not to us, it's not to any benefit of our own or any glory of our own, but to God be all the glory. We want to give God all the glory. Why? Because of his steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, we talked about a couple weeks ago, steadfast love there is the Hebrew word chesed, okay? That unconditional, consistent Incredible love of the Lord, gracious, merciful. It encompasses all of that into one entity. And it's translated steadfast love. The steadfast, faithful love of the Lord is faithfulness. Now, if you don't understand why that might have been a challenge for the nation of Israel, or why they even needed a reminder to begin with, well, this is where it's really important for us to have a familiarization with the Old Testament. Genesis through Malachi. There's many people who may be more comfortable reading the New Testament, and yet without the context of the Old Testament, we really struggle to fully encapsulate or grasp the the scope of God's faithfulness, the scope of his mercy. And and so the, the short summary of this is... God created man and woman equally in his image. He set them in the garden. Man and woman chose to sin against God. Sin enters the world. Throughout even the time of sin entering the world, God still purposes to redeem his people. You enter into this long period of time where you see mankind grow and develop, all living under the bondage of sin. The wickedness of man grows rampant. So God sends a flood, and we know the story of Noah. And Noah and his family are the only ones spared because of their faithfulness to the Lord. That period ends. We see generations come from that, and here's where the story really starts to make a big shift. The person of Abraham called by God to go. He literally said, go, Abraham, and I will reveal the rest later. Abraham trusts the Lord. He goes. There is many messes in the midst of Abraham's story. But it culminates with God fulfilling his promise to Abraham to give him a son named Isaac. Isaac has his own adventures in the midst of all that's going on. He has two sons, twin boys, named Jacob and Esau. In that story, those brothers are really pitted against each other. And even though in 
Jacob's, even though in Isaac's mind, Esau, being the oldest, is going to be the one to carry out the future lineage, God had other plans. Those plans were made a mess. That's why when we were in Genesis, we constantly said, what a mess, right? People make a mess of what God has given them, and God redeems the mess. Praise Jesus for that. Jacob is renamed Israel, and he has 12 sons, from which we get the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel and Jacob are the same person. The youngest at the time that the story continues is a young man named Joseph. Joseph has a pretty rough part of his life where his brothers throw him into a pit to die, then they sell him into slavery. He ends up working for Potiphar in Egypt and ends up being falsely accused of doing something he didn't, and then he's thrown in prison for years and eventually becomes over all of Egypt, managing what's happening. Well, it's in the midst of this that the Lord brings about a famine upon the land of which he's raised Joseph up for that purpose. And the whole family of Israel ends up coming to Egypt. This is how we enter the period of the Exodus. In the period of the Exodus, the, the, Joseph dies, a new Pharaoh comes into power and sees all of the nation of Israel that's growing rapidly because of the blessing of the Lord and goes, these people are a threat. And therefore, he says, we should enslave them so that they will not overthrow us. He enslaves the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel cries out to the Lord after years of slavery. And when we say years, we're talking hundreds of years, okay? This is not a short period of time. The nation of Israel is enslaved. They cry out to the Lord. God raises up a man named Moses. Moses is called by the Lord to come into Egypt and bring out the nation of Israel. At the onset, you know what Moses says? Ha! You got the wrong guy. I can't talk well. This is not me. Well, if you didn't know a little bit of Moses' background, he murdered an Egyptian. That's what caused him to flee. He had his own baggage. And yet, in spite of his mess... God purposed to use him. So now we're in this state where Moses comes into Egypt and over and over again, refusal to let the nation of Israel go. After plague, after plague, after plague, finally they're let go and they come to the river. The Egyptian army's closing in. The people go, why'd you bring us out here? It was better when we were enslaved, enslavement. It was better when we were entrapped. At least we had food. At least we wouldn't die in the wilderness. And God reveals right in front of a people who even in that short amount of time forgot what God had already done. Parts the Red Sea, they cross on dry land. God brings them to the promised land. They refuse to go in. They wander in the wilderness. For 40 years, a whole generation dies off. And then Joshua brings them. He stops the Jordan River for them to come into the Jordan River and gives them great conquest and success in the promised land. Now, that is Genesis all the way through Joshua in a very short summary. The reason I give this to you is because it is in light of these truths in all that has happened in the nation of Israel that the psalmist writes these psalms. It's where, why Psalm 114 talks about the sea, the Jordan turned back, the sea looked and fled, highlights the authority and the power that God has even over the natural world. It reminds the people to look back and remember what God has done and therefore be motivated to praise him. So when we think about the purpose of Psalm 115, we need remember that it's being written that a discouraged people might be encouraged by remembering the past. How many times do we lose sight of who God is and what he has done, and we turn and we do our own thing? 
The story of the nation of Israel in Scripture is relevant to every single one of us. Because you and I are not alone in our tendency to do our own thing instead of trust the Lord. The goal of this is that for the sake of God's steadfast love and faithfulness, that we would trust him and praise his name. Now, one of the reasons that we see in Psalm 115 that the people would have had reason to be discouraged is in verses two and three. Why should the nation say, where is their God? The mocking of the, the nations. And when you see the word nations here, it's talking about people who are not walking in faith before God. Okay? When we get to other parts of scripture, the term nations is used to refer to God's care for all peoples. In the Psalms here, it's speaking of those people groups that are not following the Lord. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Now, some of you have experienced some sort of mockery, maybe, for the faith that you profess. And maybe it's this very thing. Where is your God? Something happens. Well, where's your God at? You say that he is who he says he is. Where, where is he? And I love the response of this song. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Now, we may not understand the significance of this, but here's really the illustration. The nations, even though they may not have worshipped Jehovah God, they would have worshipped some sort of image. Carved image of rock or wood or gold or some other precious metal. And in so doing, these people really were saying, look, I can show you my God. He sits on my table. Where's your God? And the equivalency of that for any person who trusts the Lord is, is kind of laughable. And, and this is where my illustration comes in. So if you know me at all, you know I am a John Deere fanatic, okay? And if you ever have been in my office, you will see that they're everywhere. And the most common question I get in there is, do they ever get used? Like, do I let my son play with them? And I go, no. <laughs> he has his own. And that was part of the reason they had to be brought to my office. Okay? And logically speaking, I mean, of course, any child that sees this is going to go, why would you leave it on the shelf? Here's the point. In order for this to do anything, what has to happen? I have to move it. I have to transport it. It is not self-sufficient. The same is true when the psalmist is encountering these other nations that are going, well, where is your God? Mine's right here. And the laughable aspect of this is that the people of Israel, and you and I, if we trust in the Lord, should equally be able to say, well, our God is over all things, and he does whatever he pleases. And it's really kind of a short way around of saying, you know, I don't have to move my God. I don't have to transport him when I go somewhere. I don't have to be responsible for making him do what I want him to do. He does all that he pleases. And it goes on to expound upon this further. Verse 4, their idols, speaking of the nations, are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throat. And then verse 8 may be one of the most convicting verses in this psalm. Those who make them become like them, and so do all who trust in them. The simple truth about this family is that you become what you worship. You ever heard that statement, you are what you eat? 
My, my kids always get a kick out of that when we bring something like that up and then they imagine themselves as a block of cheese. But there is something really significant if we step back and we go, wait a minute, those who make them, who make these idols become like them and so do all who trust in them. So do all who trust in them. You become what you worship. If I choose to worship money, I'm going to become a materialist. If I choose to worship my job or my career, I'm going to become a workaholic. If I choose to worship my children, I'm going to become a stressed out, overwhelmed parent. If I choose to worship, fill in the blank. It's not hard for us to see that we indeed do become what we worship because we give all of our time to it. We devote all of ourselves to it. We invest everything we have to it. May that be only the Lord. In the midst of this ridicule, there's something we can hang tight to. It's this call to trust the Lord even in the midst of ridicule. In the midst of nations who may say, well, where is your God? And we should be able to, I pray that you will remember even this image picture up here and go, my, my God is not on this earth. He created it. My God doesn't have to be pushed along. His purposes never fail. So I will stand firmly even if I'm discouraged to go, you know what, thank goodness, I don't have to go to my wood shop and make my God. But here's the challenging part. You may have made a God that you didn't realize you've made a God. And in so doing, you need to seriously consider what do you worship? Colossians 3 reminds us of this. If you've been raised with Christ, if you say, I follow Jesus, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, as we continue in this, it shifts to this exhortation in verse 9. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. Now the significance of the nation of Israel as God's chosen people, the house of Aaron as the priestly household that was established to direct the people back to worship the Lord. But we should love the fact that the psalmist even includes here those who fear the Lord. Proverbs 1 reminds us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The emphasis being on there is hope for those who fear the Lord. There is hope for those and blessing for those who fear the Lord. And one of the things I love is in the midst of this, verses 12 and 13, it doesn't matter what status we are, as I said before. He will bless, he will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. So the question becomes, who or what do we worship? Ecclesiastes talks about the fear of the Lord as well. Ecclesiastes, this is chapter 12, says the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is a great verse to just reference back to if you're questioning who has God called us to be? 
Uh, he's called us to fear him and keep his commandments. And by fear him, it's acknowledge that he is God and you are not. It's acknowledging that he's in control and we are not. It's acknowledging that he is the only righteous judge and we are not. It's acknowledging that he is the only one capable of breathing life into our lungs and can take it away just as easily. It's the fear of God. The last sections of this, <clears throat> there's a prayer of blessing in 14 and 15. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. Why should they anticipate this? Well, the accountability here is if they don't fear the Lord, then they shouldn't expect this. The simple reality, bringing this full circle, is for you and I to realize if we don't trust Christ, the only way to the Lord, we should not expect blessing from the Lord. If we don't pursue the only way to the Father, we should not expect the blessings of being near the Father. If we choose to chart our own way instead of following after the Lord, we should not be surprised when we face significant difficulty and don't experience the blessings of the Lord. Now, this is all to say that you may experience earthly blessings. <clears throat> A sinful world has much to offer you. It will offer you success in ways your flesh will long for. It will allow you pursuits that will invigorate your earthly body and yet in the scope of eternity are absolutely worthless. So the question becomes, who do I trust? What do I trust? Who do I worship? The end result of one who fears the Lord, who trusts the Lord, who praises the Lord or ultimately who comes to this place, that when our trust is in the Lord, we can't help but praise Him. A really good sign that we are not trusting in the Lord is if we can't praise Him, even in the midst of the storm. It's a really good gauge. If I'm in a, and, and family, man, I've been there. And I, when I say I've been there, I'm not talking about like, oh, Pastor Matt, you know, 10 years ago, he was in this spot. Family, I was there last week. I was there last week. And if you had asked me on Friday where I was at, last, not, not this past Friday, but the one before, okay? This last week was a, was a great week. The week before that, not so much. And it was simply because I was seeking to trust in my own abilities and all of these earthly things. Simple example, seeking to trust my cars, and then they break down, and it's like the world's ending. And when you look back on that stuff, I go, God, it, it really wasn't as big of a deal as I made it. It's such a pointless little thing, but in the moment, oh, I was mad. And in my anger, in that moment, I go, all right, God, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeking to serve you, like, what, what is this? And early this last week, I took a day. My, my therapy is if I can operate a piece of machinery. So I took a day, I went and I sprayed our bean fields just by myself. And in that moment, the Lord brought Colossians 3 back to my mind. That's why I put it in here. And the Lord simply convicted me that you are way too concerned about stuff that's all about you. You're way too concerned about stuff of this world. You've taken your eyes off of the things that are eternal. And in that moment, I, I, I just wept. I just wept. And I went, yep, that's exactly right. So we enter these seasons and times where we, we fail to trust the Lord. And what I'm telling you is, 
if we're trusting in the Lord, then regardless of what we face, we're going to be motivated to say, praise, praise God. Praise God. Why? Because, Lord, I know, I know who you are and what you've done. And in the scope of eternity, you've accomplished everything. I, I can't do anymore. I literally cannot do anything more to accomplish what God has already done in Jesus. He has already done it in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that is our hope for the return of Christ. The heavens are the Lord's heavens. The earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any go down into silence. That is not saying, it's not speaking about eternal, eternity, where scripture reveals that we praise the Lord. Instead, it's talking about when we go, when we die, we no longer praise the Lord on this earth. We no longer have the opportunity to praise him in front of the rest of the world to reveal who we trust. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. So church family, regardless of what comes in this life, we will trust the Lord. Whether in plenty or in nothing, we will trust the Lord. Whether in weeping or rejoicing, we will bless the Lord and praise his name. May it be said about who we are that from this time forth and forevermore, as long as he gives us breath in our lungs, we will praise the Lord. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come. And as they do, I want you to stand with me. As we consider this, there's an aspect of our trusting and praising the Lord that's never meant to be done in isolation. So I want you to know, if you're in a state of trial or struggling, and you're just struggling to trust the Lord, you're struggling to praise the Lord, don't just walk away from here and go, man, I guess I'm just really struggling to trust the Lord. Let's do something about that. And maybe it's because you've never trusted the Lord to begin with. And to you, I would simply say that there is one hope for eternity. It's, it's Christ. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Those of you who have trusted the Lord, maybe you're just in a season of intense trial. And in that, my challenge to you this week is that you reach out to someone and you share that struggle. And if someone, here's the other challenge, because you may be the person someone reaches out to. And if someone reaches out to you, You don't need to have the answers. You simply need to remind them of who God is and then pray that the Lord would make himself known to them. That's it. You don't have to have the solutions. Direct them to the one who does. Okay? Now I want to do something before we sing this last song. I just want us, the end of this Psalm 115 just resounds with an exclamation. Praise the Lord. And when I read these, I visualize in my head wanting to hear that exclamation. And so I want, I'm going to count to three, and I want us to to say this as loudly as we can. Because we have every reason to praise him as loudly as we possibly can. Okay? And if it's not, if it's not quite there the first time, I'm going to count again, and we're going to do it one more time. All right? Let's try this. One, two, three. I think we can do better. One, two, three. Praise the Lord. Father, we want to do just that because we recognize who you are and what you've done. And we can't add anything more to that, Lord. Lead us back to a place of trust and unashamed adoration of you, regardless of the season that we're in right now. In Jesus' name.